Welcome to Behavior Grooves. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. Imagine, Kurt, that you're faced with a choice between picking a dirty nickel off the ground and putting it in your mouth, or spending a night in some very well-cleaned pair of Charles Manson's pajamas. What would you prefer? Uh, Charlie Manson's pajamas? Uh, <laughs> uh, come on. I mean, that's pretty simple, right? Yeah, it should be, right? But we know that preferences and actions aren't always 100% in sync, but the answer to this question is an indicator on where you stand on magical thinking. Oh, Magical thinking is closely linked to your willingness to believe in conspiracy theories. Uh, in case you're not familiar with conspiracy theories, our guest, Eric Oliver from the University of Chicago, gave us a working definition. A conspiracy theory is one where... Believing that there is some sort of unseen intentional force that's causing something to happen and accepting that as an explanation over something that's empirically verifiable. And more than just standard political reasons for polarization, his work suggests that what divides us most are the divergent worldviews between intuitionists and rationalists. The difference between favoring an emotional lens on our world compared to a more rational view of the world. And I'm here to tell you this, the differences are huge. Part of our polarization and our, the, the, the problem that we have in terms of conversing as a country is that it's not simply ideology that's dividing us, it's really this kind of worldview or ontology that's really separating. Eric Oliver teaches at the University of Chicago where he is a professor of political science. However, his work is closely linked to psychologists such as Jonathan Haidt, and the way Eric talks about his research is very much in line with social psychologists and sociologists. His observations come from more than 20 years of research, and as the author of five books on political science, we were pleased to have him as a guest and were big fans of his work for some time. Yeah, just to tee things up for you, we spoke to Eric about how liberals and conservatives name their children, which was kind of fun. That was. Uh, yeah, the rise of intuitionism, having dinner with a sports star rather than a rock star, and of course, conspiracy theories. And mm. after that, Kurt and I groove on some key concepts, and then we wrap things up with a bonus track and groove idea for the week. Before we dive into our conversation, I just want to remind you that for less than the cost of just one pumpkin spice latte each month, you could be supporting Behavior Group's mission to expand the community of people applying behavioral science to work and life. So please join the other supporters at our Patreon site at www.patreon.com forward slash behavioral grooves and pledge the amount that's right for you. Now it's time to sit back with your intuitive and rational recliner with a cup of conspiracy theory and enjoy our conversation with Eric Oliver. Eric Oliver, welcome to Behavioral Groups. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Well, we are excited to have you. And as we, we mentioned earlier, we start with a speed round. So I, I'm going to start it off, Tim, if you're okay with that. You go right ahead, Kurt. Yeah. All right. All right. What, what so questions would, have you got in your, in your head this morning? <laughs> <laughs> would you rather have dinner with your favorite sports star or your favorite musician? Um, probably my favorite uh, sports star because I always have this problem. If I have the more I know about my favorite musicians, the less I like them. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> that's a good that's a good way of, of looking at it, right? Gonna keep that that yeah, image up there. I, I like to keep my musicians in an aura of mystery. <laughs> oh, see, there's there's good conversations around that uh, later. We'll we'll definitely come back to that. So, would would you rather uh, learn a new instrument or a new language? Uh, a new instrument. I'm terrible with languages. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, what what, what new instrument comes to mind? What would you, you know, like? I actually just started playing piano last year. Um, so uh, we bought a house and part of the negotiation of a house came with a piano. And I was like, oh, I've got this piano. Maybe we should start learning it. So. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. It's been fun. Yeah. All right. Coffee or tea? A coffee. And coffee. All okay. right. Hey, no hesitation <laughs> on that. Some implicit bias, I think. Uh, what about uh, true or false? Do liberals choose different names for their children than conservatives do? Uh, yes, they do. O on average. On All right. Average. So I, we, yeah. we know that you've done some research on this. So, so uh, get into that a little bit, if you wouldn't mind. 
Yeah, so um, I, I was working with some graduate students and we were trying to figure out whether or not liberals and conservatives have different tastes, like consumer tastes. And the problem with measuring most consumer tastes is that they're endogenous to what uh, producers are making. So, you know, Subaru markets their cars to liberals. Um, uh, and you can think like, you know, probably chewing tobacco markets it to conservatives. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we're trying to figure out what, what would be an indicator of kind of consumptive behavior that nobody really markets anything about. And baby names came out. So we started doing all this research on baby names. <laughs> and basically what we found out was that uh, baby names relates to where you are on the socioeconomic spectrum. So the higher your socioeconomic status, the more likely you are to use a kind of conventional or traditional baby name. But where you see a big dif differentiation is amongst the upper strata is between conservatives and liberals. And conservatives continue to um, name their children with traditional ways, but liberals begin choosing less usual names, both for boys and for girls. And um, the difference between your sort of upper status liberals and kind of lower socioeconomic status people is that when lower status people are choosing unusual names, they're basically oftentimes making the names up or they're, they're choosing crass commercial products like Hennessy, for example, or Pepsi. <laughs> so, you know, you go through the actual list of baby names, you just, wow, people are really naming their kids this. Whereas liberals, we think, are actually kind of signaling their cultural capital. Um, uh, conservatives, I think, with baby names, like to signal economic capital and liberals typically having more cultural capital than economic capital, capital like to signal the, their cultural capital. So you start seeing names like, you know, Emerson, um, you know, Shaw, Esme, you know, these kind of obscure literary artistic references. And so now I, I go around like my kid's school uh, and I, you know, I look the names of the locker and I'm like, liberal, liberal, liberal. <laughs> uh, and um, the other interesting thing is that uh, – liberals tend to choose more feminine sounding names. If you go through and you list, look at like most girls and boys names, boys names tend to have a lot of hard consonants, like ka and ta and er sounds. Um, and liberals tend to have more like e's and ahs. And they like that, that schwa, you know, at, at the end of a, a name like Ella, you know, uh -huh. Emma. And so uh, if you want to find out whether or not someone's parents are conservative, like a girl whose name is Taylor, Odds are conservative parents. Um, and, you know, to me, the great sort of emblematic test case of this was if you look at the Obama kids, Sasha and Malia, you know, very melodic, liberally sounding names. And if you look at Sarah Palin's kids, like Track, Trig, Piper, you know, Bristol, you know, like rrr, kind of sounding Alaskan names. So very wow. interesting. <laughs> it well, just plays out. How how did how did you match the data up? How did how did you you match birth names with uh, with ideological thinking? Sure. So that was a bit of a challenge. But um, luckily, the state of California has a lot of kids born every year. About a half a million kids are born in California every year, and um, you could apply and get the data. And what we got from that were the um, names and addresses of all the birth mothers. And, um, and they, the birth records also had some information about the mother's socioeconomic status. And then, but they obviously don't have anything about their political orientation. So what we could do is based on where the mothers were living, we could look at sort of the voting patterns in their precincts. Uh, and so we could basically see if they are in liberal neighborhoods or conservative neighborhoods. Now, obviously, you might have some, you know, liberals living in conservative neighborhoods and vice versa. But, you know, when you have that many cases, you can get a pretty good indicator of, of what you would find. And I think the, the thing that was remarkable for us is that we actually found these patterns. I mean, the fact that. <laughs> <laughs> right, that it exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That there are these kind of very clear demonstrable differences uh, in, in naming behavior uh, across this was really astounding for us. Yeah. I find it fascinating that we can go through our kids' school now and, and look and see the kids' names and go, oh, probably coming from a conservative family or coming from a liberal family. That'll be very interesting. Once we actually get to go back to school, I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll, I'll now have this whole new game to play when I go in uh, to, to the schools. Um, so that's fascinating. I know you've done a lot of work, too, on 
uh, conspiracy theories and uh, how people, different kind of aspects of conspiracy theories. And uh, one of the things that Tim and I talk about is this magical thinking aspect of that. That is one of the aspects uh, that lends itself into that arena. Can you talk a little bit about some of the the background of, of the conspiracy theory research and then what your research is pointing to? And I know it's pretty broad, so we'll, we'll probably narrow in on it as sure, we go. Sure. So it, it actually started for me in the uh, mid-90s. I was a graduate student at Berkeley, and I was walking down Telegraph Avenue, and this guy came up to me and said, hey, man, you got to read this. And he handed me this sheet of paper, and it had this little scrawl, and it was this elaborate conspiracy theory involving Queen Elizabeth and the Trilateral Commission and the Illuminati. <laughs> And, you know, there are a lot of crazy people running around Berkeley. And, you know, I, I immediately, you know, my first inclination was like, uh, you know, another Berkeley crazy. But, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I was also thinking a lot about how people think about politics uh, and how they understand their political world. And it occurred to me that, like, this guy was going out of his way to sort of you know, disseminate this worldview that he had. And this worldview was not captured in any of our models within political science about how people understand politics. It was just completely out of that realm. And and rather than think of this guy as kooky, um, you know, I have enough. I am, I'm, I'm from Texas and I have enough relatives back in Texas who also believe in these types of conspiracy theories. I was like, this guy is not alone. Um, so, you know, I, I, I was thinking about it, but I wasn't quite sure what to do with it. Well, fast forward about 10 years and I had some room on some surveys that I was doing. And I thought about this guy and I said, well, you know, let me put on a few conspiracy theories and see what kind of support is out there. And what blew me away is I, I think I asked about six different conspiracy theories and about half of the public agreed with at least one of them. And I remember I, I, I showed this at a, at a conference and there was a big uproar and everyone was like, no, that can't be, that can't be. No, 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 no. And I was like, no, really, this is what the data are. So that I knew I was kind of on to something because my colleagues were really mad at me. <laughs> always, always a good measure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I started kind of looking into this and the thing that really leapt out is, is trying to figure out well, what is it that predicts whether or not people believe in conspiracy theories. And the biggest correlates that were out there was whether or not you had a lot of paranormal and supernatural beliefs. And that kind of was interesting is like, well, why that in particular? And what had occurred to me was the sort of underlying theme that connected conspiracy theories with these other types of beliefs, this magical thinking. And when we're talking about magical thinking, what we basically mean is believing that there is some sort of unseen intentional force that's causing something to happen and accepting that as an explanation over something that's empirically verifiable. Uh, so, the, you know, magical thinking has a kind of pejorative context. So let me explain, like, you know, if you live on your, you know, little tropical island and you believe that, you know, you got to throw teenagers into the volcano every year to keep the volcano god happy, um, you know, if you don't know anything about plate tectonics or geology, that might be your science. And that's not necessarily magical thinking. But if someone comes along and sort of says, no, you know, it's actually volcanoes come from things that have nothing to do with volcano gods, um, then that becomes, and you still do it, then that's magical thinking. Um, and so what's interesting is to, why is it that people persist in their magical beliefs and trying to think about what is the appeal of magical thinking and why is it so pervasive? Um, you know, uh, Max Weber, the founder of sociology, predicted about 100 years ago, he said, you know, this was he, he saw the disenchantment of the West. And he said, oh, you know, we're moving away from the sort of the magical beliefs that animated the medieval mind. And we're moving to this sort of science, you know, more rationalist orientation. But and if you look at the United States, you know, there's still large numbers of people who really reject science and reject a rationalist framework, you know, and, you know, Max Weber might have said, what is going on here? This is not what I <laughs> uh, And so I was trying to think about, OK, well, what's behind magical thinking? Why do you find why do people find magical thinking so much more compelling than, say, a scientific or a rationalist framework? And so I started doing research into psychology and anthropology around magical beliefs. And kind of the what came to mind is that magical thinking, I think, is you know, seductive force and powerful force because it represents our intuitive ways of understanding the world, that it draws on these intuitions. And I think it draws on these intuitions in two ways. Um, 
One of the ways it draws on our intuitions is that when we understand the world, we don't do it through a purely cognitive framework. We draw on our emotions and our emotions are important for us in two ways. They, they're important because they motivate our thinking in particular ways, and they also inform our thinking. And when you face the world and you, the world is a big, complicated place with a lot of uncertainty, and that typically generates a lot of anxiety for us. We don't like to feel uncertain. Anxiety is an uncomfortable position. And so we try to placate our anxiety as much as we can. And a lot of magical thinking comes about trying to placate anxiety. If you think about like who are really big, chronic, magical thinkers, people who have a lot of superstitions, it's people who are engaged in activities where there's an uncertain outcome. So like deep sea fishermen, for example, are notoriously superstitious, baseball players, um, mm. things, soldiers, uh, same way, gamblers, all of these types of people really rely on a lot of superstitious beliefs. And they're trying to basically manage their own anxiety in the context of great uncertainty. But the other thing that happens is that when, um, when we have these emotions, we also draw on them as informative. And I, I, I give an example about this is um, my son, Ethan, when he was five, I went to his bedroom. He was, you know, complaining about monsters in the closet, monsters in the closet. And we had this whole, you know, this is like 1130 night. I'm really tired. He's tired. I'm getting nowhere on this. And then finally he turns to me and said, well, you know, dad, if there's, if there are no monsters in the closet, then why am I afraid? Mm. And yeah. Okay. All right. You got me. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but you know, I, I realized that's, you know, he, he basically, and I think this is when we, when we draw on our intuitions, if we're feeling apprehensive, we're actually more likely to then look and seek answers that sort of validate or rationalize our fears. And the irony of that is in the short run that may placate us. So when it comes to a conspiracy theory, if I think like, you know, there's a secret group of small, powerful Illuminati that are out there that are making the world happen, that may give me a sense, oh, okay, I finally know what's going on. I know why coronavirus is happening now. They, they are out there sort of making coronavirus happen. But on the other hand, it reaffirms this notion that, wow, there are really this nefarious, powerful, evil people out there that are controlling things. So in the, you know, it may sustain my anxiety or sustain a kind of chronic anxiety. Um, is it tied into locus of control at all? Um, I didn't really measure or look at that, but I, I assume it is. I think there are a lot of, there's a sort of constellation of different um, psychological propensities that are around there. And I, I think one of the things that comes up when you see this a lot are, you know, people with a lot of OCD syndromes, uh, mm -hmm. obsessive compulsive behavior, uh, and um, uh, and I think that's probably also, you know, akin to, you know, in some sort of Venn diagram with locus of control. Oh, and what about, um, is there, you know, I think about uh, Jonathan Haidt's moral foundations and, uh, you know, I, I'm not aware of you doing any of this work specifically, but do you have any intuitions that there's a, a map across the kinds of things that, that uh, would lead someone to be, you know, high or low on, on any of those five foundations, you know, uh, you know, sanctity and purity and stuff like that. So I, um, I've had some uh, back and forth with, with, uh, John about this. Um, I think a lot of his measures, I, I'm not really convinced that they're actually measures of, um, you know, some sort of innate propensities. And one of the reasons why is that uh, I did a study, which we have, we presented some conferences, but for a variety of reasons, we haven't been able to get published, um, which examines his sort of the, the, do liberals and conservatives really have rely differently on these different moral foundations. And the fact mm -hmm. that is those differences really disappear once you control for whether or not people are religiously fundamentalist and evangelical beliefs. And, and so it's really, you know, it's uh, religious conservatives in the United States who really rely on purity, uh, authority, um, uh, loyalty that those really emphasize us. Now, the difficulty is, is that because, you know, we have a selection of certain kinds of people who have those innate proclivities or because they're in these kind of belief systems, which actually reinforce, you know, if you look at most evangelical conservative Christian beliefs, they really reinforce purity, um, you authority, know, loyalty, yeah. loyalty. So um, yeah. I think that's, that becomes a difficult issue. Um, John does work that was very inspiring for my own and, in a lot of ways, particularly some of his, his early work, because the second part of magical thinking um, that I think relates to this is when people are trying to make sense of the world, they do rely heavily on certain kinds of heuristics um, and, you know, these sort of shortcuts to understanding, 
uh, and sort of and making inferences. And in Jonathan's work, particularly on, on disgust and some of his early stuff, really inspired uh, my work on this in terms of thinking about, okay, how might we measure sort of a sensitivity towards certain kinds of heuristics? And, um, and so I think there's a little bit more in terms of when we th start thinking about moral foundations, there, there is a, a sense that these are heuristics that people tap into, right? Uh, and so to give you, you know, a, a, an example, James Frazier, who wrote The Golden Bough, you know, with this big compendium of magical beliefs that was collected in the late 19th century. And he had this idea that there were basically two kinds of magical beliefs. Um, one that we would, and we would actually call these heuristics now. So one is a contagion heuristic and the idea like, you know, we think that if we have contact with something that is good or belong to like, say, you know, a saint or the Pope, that it has magical qualities that can, you know, are good for us. And similarly, if we have contact with something that's been, you know, in contact with someone like Charles Manson or Hitler, it may be <laughs> painted and it's bad. And that's, you know, that sense of, you know, kids have this sense of cooties, for example. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so that's, I think, an important heuristic. Um, I think this idea of a representativeness heuristic is also important. So we think that things that look like other things um, will share their qualities uh, for them. And, you know, we um, we tested this out early on when kind of doing research on what I was with my graduate students. And we had a survey question and we divided it up into sort of we divided respondents up into two groups. And we asked them the first group. We said, you know, suppose uh, um, you were going to play for a two million dollar lottery. And a friend said that he had won a lottery by rubbing his lottery ticket uh, on a, and then, so the, for the first half of the group, we said a paper napkin and said, you know, would you rub a lottery ticket on a paper napkin? And, um, and about 40% of people said that they would do that. And then the second half of the group, we basically said, would you rub, would you rub your lottery ticket on a dollar bill? And does that seem like a good thing? And about 60% said that they would do that. So we get a you know, much bigger, diff you know, people are much more likely to sort of rub lottery tickets on dollar bills than paper napkins. And of course that makes perfect sense because of course rubbing a lottery ticket on a dollar bill is going to be much more effective for you. <laughs> of course. <laughs> right, right, right. Who doesn't know that? Right. <laughs> so, um, but that, that's kind of how these heuristics work. And I think what, a lot of what John's work was getting into uh, was, was trying to, I think, or what inspired me from his work was, was was thinking, trying to think a little bit more about how these heuristics might operate, particularly when it comes to magical beliefs. So bringing this all back to conspiracy theories, what we see in conspiracy theories is not only are they fueled by anxiety and apprehension, but they really rely heavily on a lot of heuristics, um, a representativeness heuristic. Um, you can think an availability heuristic, you know, people... Mm -hmm look at the sort of range of, of circumstances. They look at sort of just immediate information. I think an anthropomorphizing heuristic is really, really important here. So if you look at a lot of conspiracy narratives, you know, they, they give a singular intentionality to things like, you know, you know, the CIA wants this or, yeah. you know, Wall Street wants this as if these, you know, very complex multidimensional organizations, you know, have a, a mind of their own. Um, yeah, yeah. I I, I have uh, some family members who remind me every time we get we see a jet go over that the uh, the the you know the white stuff that is behind the engines is disseminating some kind of control over us. Uh, that that's not just jet fuel vaporizing in the atmosphere. That there really is something about that that is controlling us specifically. And boy, haven't you noticed that there's more of them today than there were ten years ago? And they've got all the rationale for it. It's like wow, it's it's really hard to have the discussion with them too. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm curious. I, this is something that, that now that you mentioned that I'd like to follow up because one of the the I you know side effects of the COVID shutdown has been the absence of air traffic. Uh, and, you know, three people think that <laughs> I, I'm very curious to see how our vapor trail conspiracy theorists are now interpreting this. Like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. I heard on, on NPR this morning, they were talking about there was actually the measuring the, the blueness of the sky. And in April, it was bluer than it has been 
for a long time because of that. But now summer and you get dust and, and farming and other things that are going on. It's not. I, I've gotta, being- I, I have to ask that question, though. I have to I have to go back to my, my <laughs> in-laws and just say, by the way, who's controlling us now if, yeah, if yeah, it's yeah. not, you know, the chemtrails? Yeah. <laughs> so have you noticed or have you done any research on uh, – the has conspiracy theories increased given covid have we have we become more of a kind of this this world that hey obviously something is going on or is it just the continuation of what's been happening in the past and now it's just replaced with masks and china went out and did this on purpose and all the other conspiracy theories that we're hearing yeah so i have not had something in the field in the past couple of months so i, I don't know specifically but I have been basically asking in surveys pretty much every year, every other year for about 15 years now about conspiracy theories. And the levels are pretty constant. Uh, okay. It's usually about half the population. And we, we might see a little more. I mean, COVID is just ripe, ripe terrain for conspiracy, you know, because we, we still know so little about uh, the pathology. Um, it's affecting everyone. There, there's people are. It's the the world is just ripe for misinformation about this. There's a lot of politically motivated uh, misinformation that's out there. Um, there are a lot of uh, kind of grifters who are out there, basically trying to promote themselves by you know kind of putting forth false conspiracy theories. Uh, so. Um, but I don't, I don't know if, you know, so we can see that people probably have a lot of conspiracy theories about COVID. Um, one of the things I do know from my research is that health conspiracy theories tend to be amongst the most popular. Okay. Uh, and the reason is, is that they oftentimes, um, you know, political conspiracy theories oftentimes get, either have liberal or conservative political conspiracy theories. They, there are not a lot of them that travel across the ideological spectrum. Health conspiracy theories, on the other hand, do. So, for example, I've asked this question on a number of surveys. You know, do you think the Food and Drug Administration is deliberately withholding natural cures for cancer because of secret pressure from the pharmaceutical industry? And you need to get about 40, 45 percent of Americans believing in this. Uh, and and that's across the idea. You know, conservatives and liberals yeah, equally likely to be. I know you've done some work on credulity too, right? And, and this idea of, you know, how how open we are to, to just believing things and, and how that plays into, uh, again, belief in, in these conspiracy theories and other things. Can you talk a little bit about that and in particular about the, the scale that you've, you've developed around that? Is that? Sure. So um, this was work. I, I had a, an undergraduate, this brilliant undergraduate who came to me a couple of years ago and she said, you know, I'm, I'm interested in misinformation. And I said, well, why don't we start working on something together? And we basically uh, we're trying to figure out, can you measure, you know, Abraham Lincoln famously said, you can fool some of the people some of the time and all the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. And Well, can you and who can you? Fool? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, we were kind of curious about that. You know, no one ever tested Lincoln's, you know, uh, motto. <laughs> as far as we know. Uh, And the, the big the big challenge in measuring credulity, though, is how do you figure out whether or not you're actually measuring? Are some people just more credulous? Are some people more likely to believe something? And the, the difficulty is, is you know, most of what we believe depends on the message of the messenger. Mm. Uh, so we're far more likely to believe something if, if it comes from a trusted source or someone who we like. So if you know I'm conservative, if Sean Hannity tells me something, I'm much more likely to believe it. If I'm liberal, and Rachel Maddow tells me something, I'm far more likely to believe what she tells me. Um, and similarly, you know, we're probably more likely to believe things based on the message itself. Does it have cues about, you know, things, say, our partisanship or our ideology? Uh, and so what we try to do is try to figure out, are there things out there that might um, predict someone's credulity regardless? You know, can, can we figure out things that the message is it's completely indifferent to the message itself? Um, and so we. We did a battery of like 50 items uh, kind of going through with the survey, trying to figure out. And we ended up coming up with some things that we wanted to have some things that were true and some things that were false in this. Because, um, you know, when we encounter the world, uh, we're encountering true and false information. We have to differentiate. And, you know, part of the fear right now with misinformation is not just that we're duping a lot of people to believing 
you know, the wrong thing. But that the flip side of it is that we people have gotten so skeptical now that they're rejecting positive information. And we see this with COVID, like people, you know, are afraid to, for example, to wear masks or get vaccines because they don't trust anything and they don't trust any information that they're getting. Um, so we came up with the scale of this and, you know, we had some items that would be kind of uncertain and we were just curious your likelihood of believing them. So things like, you know, um, drinking up a cup of coffee before you take a nap uh, will allow you to wake up actually being much more alert than if you just took a nap without a cup of coffee. Uh, and that happens to be true. I guess there was a study that, that showed this. And so, you know, we asked something like that or, um, do you think uh, <clears throat> the U.S. Uh, uh, per, you know produce as much steel as it used to? We just hire fewer steel makers because the you know steel is so much more efficient than it used to be. Um, and so you know, giving that statement, um, and which, which doesn't uh, which doesn't sound true to me. That we're, yeah, not. yeah, we're we're producing less steel, right? Yeah, yeah, we are producing less steel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I'm taking the test. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, there, there are those kind of items. So, um, okay. uh, so we, we had, a, you know, a series of items like that. And, um, you know, then based on that, we, we try to see, okay, how well does this then predict if you, you know, how you score on this, does this predict your willingness to then, um, you know, take what is politically motivated misinformation or, um, you know, we, we gave people, they were taking surveys online. And so we gave them the kind of news feeds that they might get in Facebook or Twitter Mm -hmm. uh, we created some of those. We asked some conspiracy theories. And basically what we ended up finding is that I think the good news is that most people are kind of in the middle of the scale. Uh, and, you know, they sort of will accept some things as true and some things as false. And, you know, people aren't necessarily overly skeptical or overly credul uh, credulous. Probably about 2% of the country uh, in our sample, or at least 2% of our sample, is highly credulous. We'll just sort of seemingly believe anything. And about 5% are overly skeptical and they're just overly rejecting everything. Um, oh. And, but the vast majority of people I, I think are, you know, are, are pretty agnostic. They're in, they're in the middle. So that, I think that's probably some good news. Well, that's much better than I would have predicted, you know, prior to, to reading the study. You know, it, it, it's one of those things I would have thought that that would have been, much greater on both ends of, of that spectrum. So that, that is good news. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I, I, it still doesn't get rid of the problem of misinformation because you still have a lot of partisan ideological biases, worldview biases coming in that are influencing people's views, obviously. But, um, uh, most people aren't dupes. Think, think <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to get back to, uh, the, uh, the idea of the likelihood for someone who, uh, uh, who is believing in religious, uh, you know, the magical thinking relationship to, uh, kind of religious beliefs that within the ev evangelical Christian community, there is maybe a higher likelihood. What about just, uh, Christianity, Islam, uh, Judaism kind of in general, when it comes to likelihood to, uh, to favor conspiracy theories. So com com compared to someone who is uh, professing an agnosticism or. Sure. Or like sure. And I, I think that the difficulty with that comes, and this is what we found in our research, which was, um, you know, I, for, I, for example, I was raised Catholic. I probably still, um, I don't go to church anymore. I don't believe in God, but I still have probably a lot of, you know, intellectual baggage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I still, you know, carry around a lot of beliefs and ideas, you know, from my childhood, you know, growing up being Catholic. Um, and I think a lot of people, when they describe themselves as religious, they, they, it, it's not really a, a well thought out set. They just, they believe in God or they believe in certain ideas because that was there, but that's not necessarily informing their worldview. It's, it's just, mm. the, you know, it's like, it's like I, Oh, I go to, you know, church on Christmas and Easter because it's this ritual and I kind of do it. And I kind of believe maybe there's some force out there. That's great. And, but then there are people who are really active in terms of, understanding the world through a religious framework. And mm. uh, in the book, I, I, I quote a woman I was talking to once and she was, she had all of these different views. Some were liberal and some conservatives. They were very, very 
inconsistent with one another. Like she, on the one hand, was really into organic foods and natural medicines, and she thought the government should do more to support the poor and take care of the elderly. On the other hand, she really hated Obamacare. And she thought that, you know, Barack Obama was a secret Muslim. And uh, and she didn't really talk about what Obamacare did. She didn't really even know. And we were talking back and forth. And finally, she said, you know, the difference between you and me, Eric, is that you believe in reason and I believe in the Bible. Uh, and I know that was a very prescient thing for her to say because, yeah. you know, she was saying, like, I, I just don't have a worldview. Like, facts don't matter to me the way they matter to you. And for me, it's a worldview of, you know, I, she wasn't saying this, but I think the implicit in that was her worldview is, is motivated by symbols and metaphors and a whole different way of sort of understanding things. And so when we talk about religion here and conspiracy theories, I think what's important is to what extent religion reinforces a magical worldview. And mm. you know, a lot of religions out there, you know, if you think about like Satan in some ways, the idea of Satan is kind of a conspiracy theory. There's this sort of secret <laughs> out there that's making right. bad things happen and, you know, kind of doing things out there. Um, you know, a lot of apocalyptic um, thinking, I think, reinforces this too, this idea of this kind of grand narrative uh, mm -hmm. that's going on. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing that I think apocalyptic thinking and conspiracy theories have in common is that they put the thinker at the center of the narrative. So, you know, if I believe in a conspiracy theory, somehow or another, I'm in power and I, and I have this secret knowledge now and I'm now part of this narrative and I'm, I'm understanding and maybe I'm even, you know, by propagating the conspiracy theory, I'm fighting against it. And I see myself in that. And, you know, these sort of end times narratives are the same way. Like now is, you know, like for, you know, this is the time when we're actually, the rapture is going to happen. It didn't happen 50 years ago. And it's not going to happen 50 years from now. It's, it's happening now because I'm really, there's a sort of narcissism there that yeah. it kind of uh, promotes. And, so I think there's a commonality in that. And so that's what, when in my research on kind of magical thinking, I was trying to come up with ways of, of capturing this type of kind of intuitionism, you know, a way of someone who relies more on their intuitions and their, and as a way of understanding the world. Cause I think that's what really the difference between the, the, so the key aspect, it's not religion per se. It's the kind of intuitive worldview that religion really promotes and fosters that then makes people sort of susceptible to conspiracy theories. Theorizing. So it, it, it sounds like there's a fundamentalism here. So regardless of whether it's Christianity or Islam, if it's that, that fundamentalist belief in the absolute word of whatever the, the, the text that they're, they're believing in that lends itself into that, which t goes to your other point, which you're talking about this idea of if I am, if I know this conspiracy theory, I'm somehow special and I have some aspect of it. That fundamentalism also is that I'm special. I am one of the chosen people to, to be there. So there's some correlation there. Any, any thoughts on that? Is that something that, that you've looked at or? Um, yeah. I mean, so like, for example, one of the biggest predictors of whether or not you believe in conspiracy theories is, you know, if you believe that we're living in end times, yeah. uh, um, the other thing that, you know, we, we were sort of talking about some measures and, you know, one of the things that we came up with in the book is we try to come up with some scales about, you know, how much people rely on their intuitions when they're making uh, uh, judgments. And this goes back to your kind of lightning questions, you know, so we came up with a bunch of items that tap into to, to what extent people evaluate or weigh these heuristics uh, when they make their choices. So we ask people things like, for example, would you rather... Um, stab a photograph of your family five times with a sharp knife or stick your hand in a bowl of cockroaches or, you know, <laughs> <would> you rather <laughs> um, sleep in laundry pajamas once worn by Charles Manson or, you know, pick a dirty nickel off the ground and put it in your mouth. And we had a series of choices where people are basically having to evaluate things with sort of symbolic costs versus tangible cost. Yeah. And, you know, where you were on this scale is enormously predictive of, you know, believe having magical beliefs, but also kind of believing in conspiracy theories. And then um, when it comes to politics, I was doing this research in, uh, I started this research in 2014 uh, and in, uh, started writing this book in 2014 and 2015 was doing these surveys here. And then Donald Trump comes on the scene. Yeah. And then, you know, so here you have a, <laughs> Uh, a political figure who is, you know, an intuitionist par excellence. He's just, <laughs> you know, he, he doesn't want to think very hard. He just, he's just going with his gut. And he admits this, you know, and he just says, my gut is right. 
And if you look at his political rhetoric, it captures this. And if you look at why people are so enamored with him, it's because he is actually speaking to this intuitive way of, of worldview. So, it's, you know, not in, you know, it's not simply a coincidence that he also, you know, promotes conspiracy theories and has this conspiracy theory way of thinking, or, mm -hmm. you know, he tries to align himself with the religious right, you know, and the whole, you know, the photo op of going out and holding up the Bible. It was, very unsure about this book that he was holding, but you know, he was kind, of, <laughs> uh, kind of promoted that way. Um, and you know, sure enough, when, when we did surveys during the primaries, the the people who were sort of really strongly populist were really in favor of Donald Trump and also uh, had a high, high level of conspiracy theories. And you know, that sort of mistrust of power, that mistrust of scientific elites, of cultural elites, that sort of it's emblematic of populism really also speaks to kind of an intuitionist framework and it's in, you know, kind of comes together with conspiracy theory. They're right. And his rhetoric is reinforcing that within those people as well from, from what we can see. Right. I mean, it's that disbelief in, in media, making sure that there's the, you know, this idea that there are, you know, China is behind the, the, the vaccine or the, the coronavirus and all of those factors that go into that. Prior to the coronavirus ha happening, you know, happening, th it wasn't necessarily catastrophic. But, you know, now I think people are beginning to realize at least a, a significant portion of the population is beginning to realize the sort of limitations. I think the, the flip side of that is, you know, I often see this as like you, Donald Trump has poor approval ratings right now. It's you know, somewhere around 40 percent. And a lot of people say, well, who are the 40 percent who actually do approve of him? And I think it's Im important for people probably who listen to, you know, podcasts like this that, we are in a bubble that's very separated from the rest of the world uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, you know, in my surveys, typically 30 percent of people still say that we're living in end times as foretold by biblical prophecy. And I, I imagine like if you actually do hold that as a sincere belief, then the world must be just potent with symbols. Everywhere you go, you're looking for some validation or some, you know, idea that's going to be a part of this narrative that's that's coming forward. And so and that's a, just a very different way of understanding things. And one of the things that I think has happened in American politics is that uh, conservatism has become a much more intuitionist kind of ideological movement than it used to be. And I think liberalism on the, the flip side has become a more rationalist kind of movement. Um, and and we, we see this in our data. And I, I know like in, in Hyde Park, where we live, it's a pretty liberal community. And, you know, you see the signs, you probably see these in Minneapolis too, you know, where it's the liberal mantra, the sort of the things liberals believe in, they put it in the front yard. Like we believe that love is love, yep. you know, Black Lives Matter and science is real, you know, and it's an interesting idea of sort of staking this claim to rationalism on the left. And uh, conversely, on the on the right, if you look at the rhetoric, just the mistrust of the science around COVID, for example, um, really speaks to this. And I think that's part of our polarization and our the, the, the problem that we have in terms of conversing as a country is that it's not simply ideology that's dividing us. It's really this kind of worldview or ontology that's really separating and, you know, it's very hard for rationalists and intuitionists to sort of talk to each other. So that leads me to ask, are there any tips for how to deal with, uh, let's say, if someone in this conversation happened to have some relatives uh, that were <laughs> uh, really big conspiracy theorists? Is there, are there any tips on how to, uh, how to have a conversation with them? So I, I, have, I have two thoughts on this. The first one is, empirically speaking, I don't know. I, I, I haven't, uh, I, I got a, a question, a media question from this a couple of weeks ago, and they asked me very specifically, you know, were there any kind of clinical trials <laughs> trying to communicate, <laughs> communicate with people? And I was like, I, I, I don't know. But the, uh, my, the wisdom I, I've, I've kind of gleaned on this from talking to others, and, and this goes back to, you know, when my, my son was in, you know, in his room worried about the monsters in the closet, me trying to rationalize the monsters away was not going to make the monsters go away from him. Me listening to him and saying, I hear you, I understand you, seemed to help. And I, I think when we, when we try to speak to uh, across, when we try to speak across this ontological divide, this worldview divide, at least just trying to empathize first and trying to, to, or to, to recognize that you're just not going to reason your way out of this. Uh, and that you, no, no amount of reasoning is going to work, but like trying to listen to what the other side says and, 
hear, you know, hear what is animating their concerns? What is animating their apprehensions here? I think it's a, it's a pretty good first step. And then trying to sort of gently bring in, well, if you feel this way, then wouldn't you also feel this way about something that, you know, maybe is a concern for you? Um, but, uh, you know, the, the whole you're wrong and this is why it just never works. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. Uh, Laurie Santos's GI Joe fallacy comes to mind that knowing is not even close to half the battle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that isn't going to help. Well, and, and you get the backfire effect too, right? You get this this pushback that they they actually go further down that that road of of believing because it's now part of their self identity, and and you're questioning that, and then they have to re redouble down on that, which is you know lots of the the end of times, you know, cults that, that have been studied where, you know, they, they predict it's going to be, you know, whatever the date is and that date comes and passes and they're like, well, they just double down. Well, we, you know, we, because of what we've done, we, we've saved the world. And now it's now that end date has moved up five years or whatever it would yeah, be. Right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we don't have a lot of time left, so we have to start talking about music now okay. because this could be, this could be great. <laughs> so you said you you said that you would prefer to learn a new instrument. You've got a, a new piano in the house. Yeah. Do you play? First of all, do you play other instruments? No, no, no. Just piano. I, okay. I hit the bongo drums, maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, you know, uh, bass players would tend to say that drummers really aren't musicians, but that's the way that's the way musicians are. So, uh, so uh, what, what's what's on your playlist right now? What are you listening to? Um, you know, Spotify has totally damaged my my sense of what I'm listening to because I don't really know a lot of what I'm listening to anymore. Uh, and. Yeah. You know, it was funny. I was really into indie music when I was young and then I had kids and then I, I went to an, you know, an indie show and, and I immediately said, you know, could they turn it down? It's really loud. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then the worst was like, I was looking at the guys on stage and I was like, Oh my God, their parents must be so proud of them. And I was like, Oh, I'm just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I, I had this, period of not listening to music from the time my kids were born until a couple of years ago. And then I kind of was going back and rediscovering all of this music that I had missed. Like I had, I had kind of missed LCD sound system and I'm like, Oh my God, these guys are amazing. Uh, and I've been really enjoying like Kurt Vile and uh, oh, wow. uh, so as, as far as kind of reclaiming music that I, I, I kind of missed. Um, so I, I would say that that's in, and heavy rotation uh, for me right now. And then my, I have a 15 year old now, and of course she wants to sort of share with me all of these kind of uh, new music and, and new songs. And um, I don't and know. You're loving it, right? You're, I love every, it. Great. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I have no idea. Who these are. <laughs> <laughs> I do have to say that kids, uh, expand that musical genre that 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 i'm listening to at least i i know i I'm, I'm not a big pop person and my daughter who's 10 is big into all the pop stuff and so i listen to that and so i know most of those songs now and my son is into rap and you know the 14 year old son and he's into that so i've learned some of those that it, it has expanded my musical uh listening palette i would say are, are you uh are you one who can listen to music while you're working um if it's either classical or like sometimes when I'm writing, uh, I'll listen to like, say, Philip Glass. Um, and that's, I find that actually very stimulating. I feel like, oh, I must be doing something. I'm listening to this elevating music. So the, the, what I'm doing, <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's like a prime or a prime. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah it's, it's helpful in that regard. Wow. How uh, that, that's, uh, that's the first time we, we asked this question of, of a lot of people. We're actually uh, kind of, uh, partnering with Melanie Brooks at Columbia. She's doing some research on music while you work. And so we're kind of just collecting some anecdotal thoughts on this, but no one has ever said that they listen to music to, to sort of prompt them that they're doing something important. That's more about my ego than anything else. <laughs> or my ego reads. <laughs> oh. I can see that though. It's, it's the soundtrack to your work, right? And there's a soundtrack to the, the, the movies, right? We know when something important is going on because the music changes and that's part of that underlying, you know, aspect of, of movies and, and all of those facets. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and then getting back to the, uh, the, the earlier comment about, uh, you wouldn't really want to have dinner with a, with a favorite musician because you don't want to get to know them too much. I, I have to, I had the opportunity to be backstage at a Stephen Stills concert and who is my guitar hero, uh, in 1977. And he was coked out of his mind and, uh, and the whole backstage area was just a big drug fest. And I was a pretty young guy at the time. And it was really disappointing for me to be around this guy who I just thought was a guitar God. And it really deflated my impression of him. And then it was like, I, then I worked hard to separate the art from the artist, you know, for, for many years. And I was like, ah, fuck it. I can't figure that out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't do that. So, so tell me about your rationale for this, this idea that you wouldn't want to know too much about, about the, the artist. Well, you know, it's, uh, it, it goes back to like, you know, I'll either hear interviews or I'll read interviews with people whose work I really admire. And then like, you're reading and you're like, Oh my God, you're such a dodo <laughs> <laughs> or, or you're an awful person. I, I was thinking about like, you know, I, I, I read, uh, um, Keith Richards, you know, biography, that was the same one I was going to. Exactly <laughs> yeah. same thought. I, I, I thought he, he basically could have, you know, titled it the unenlightened one. You know, <laughs> like, it was like, oh man, Keith, wow, you're really petty. Well, <laughs> I, I heard an interview with him on NPR, and I can't remember with it who. And I just thought, oh my god, you are such a, a misogynist kind of idiot that it just it blew me i'm like going i can't listen to a rolling stones album the same way so yeah it's really really kind of fascinating so you did say though that you go with the sports with your your your, your sports who who would that be who would you who would you want to have dinner with from your 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 sports fan oh wow um huh who would i want to depends on what we're eating i suppose <laughs> <laughs> um well, you, you were born in Texas, but you live in Chicago now. I mean, do, do you have a Chicago fan base as a you know Texas? Yeah, I, no, I haven't really ad adopted the Chicago sports teams. I'm still okay. That's good. My, my my Houston teams that I kind of grew up with, uh, but you know, you know, you know the, the 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 people who I I don't know if these count as sports fans, but like you know, there are a couple of NBA coaches. Yeah, who are are pretty cool. So Steve Kerr, I would love to hang out. Oh, with. He's like a great guy. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, yeah, in some ways, I think they would be better, better during time conversations. I don't know if they kind of sports stars, though. But they, well, Steve Kerr played. I mean, he was, yeah. you know, he was on the, the Chicago Bulls for that so long. And, and yeah, and all that. So but yeah, I, I would agree. You know, Popovich is another yeah. one who I would love to just sit down and have a, have a dinner with just because I think the, the thought process is so fascinating to think about how they're not only thinking about the game and the game mechanics, but also the personalities of the team. And how do you, how do you motivate these egos that are huge? And, and those two, I think do it really well. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, Colin Kaepernick would probably be an interesting dinner time oh. guest too. Uh, yeah. Just like, how is this happening to you? <laughs> <laughs> and and what's, what's it like to be him? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, at this time. All right. Well, Eric, thank you. This has been absolutely enlightening, fun, and I, I, I've just been thoroughly enjoying it, and I, I'm sure our listeners will too. So All thank right. you very much for your time. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's great to meet you guys and great to chat. So thanks for all your interest in my work too. <laughs> it's great. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our conversation with the amazing Eric Oliver, have a free flowing discussion and talk about whatever else comes into our magically enhanced brains. Yeah. Magical thinking. Yeah, magical just, thinking. Unicorns, unicorns. and uh, <laughs> fairy tales. Fairies. There you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Pretty interesting stuff. Fantastic. We covered so much ground with, with Eric. I, I really just loved it. And when thinking about this grooving session, um, I think you said it really well, Kurt, that we don't really have easy things that we can just chunk out. That, that really what we covered is how we think about things. 
right? Yeah, I mean, that was the cool thing about this, you know, from a political scientist talking about thinking, right? Yeah. <laughs> this idea yeah. uh, that we think uh, and again, instant, uh, intuitive or rational, right? So is it that gut feeling? Is it this more process thought of, hey, let's, let's look at the, the data and figure out and, and run things? Or do you just run with what you're feeling? And it, it was a really insightful distinction uh, again, because, you know, I had made the assumption, right, of conspiracy theories and different pieces. It was conservative versus liberal bias or a Republican, Democratic kind of thing. And, and in fact, it's not. It, yeah. it is some very different underlying root causes. So, yeah. I, yeah, I love this, too. And uh, that lens really helped me focus on what the current political divide is really based on. And so when when I've heard people who support Trump say, well, Trump says what I've been thinking sort of in my heart for a long time. It isn't these outlandish, uh, you know, claims about, uh, about anything in particular. It's the fact that he's just going with his gut, Yeah. right? That he just plays from, uh, from this is how I feel rather than this is how I think. And, and I think that that's probably one of the things that irritates the liberals the most is that he's not rational, <laughs> right? He just does. He's not interested in playing in a rational field. He's interested in playing from the, the intuition side of, of in his emotions. That's that was, yeah. I, this idea of this is how I feel, not how I think, I think is just yeah. spot on. Right. Well, and then that, that, ties into, I think, a lot of how people are doing this, which gets into why having discussions or arguments or trying to persuade somebody out of a uh, gut feel is so difficult because logical, rational kind of thoughts are, are not where they're coming from. So you, you can't uh, persuade somebody from a gut feeling with rational components. It goes back to who are we talking with um, it, this idea of uh, trying to convince somebody uh, of something from a moral foundation right. versus from a, uh, you know, a, a rational thing, Andy Luttrell, right. Andy when we were talking Luttrell. with, with Andy Luttrell, who will be a, a podcast that's coming up was talking through like persuading people uh, who believe something from a moral ground point, if you're giving them all these facts and figures, but you're not touching on that moral framework that they're basing their belief on, it, it doesn't matter all the facts and figures that you do. And that's kind of the same thing of this gut feel. And, and in one, one-to-one conversations, Andy seemed to say the same thing, if I recall rightly, as Eric is saying. If you're yeah. in a one-to-one conversation with someone, the first thing to do is be empathetic. Just listen. Just listen. We need to listen to the other side. We listen to people who don't have the same worldview as us and just be empathetic and try to understand that uh, Kwame Christian talked about yeah. as well. The yes. first thing we need to do is be empathetic. And, uh, and that I love. I love hearing our guests uh, focus on that as an important takeaway for us uh, as, as, as listeners and, and as, as we live in the world this is something that could really help us is just to be more empathetic. Well, and you have to be empathetic when 50% of the public or almost 50% of the public agree with at least one conspiracy theory. Yeah. Holy <laughs> freaking right. mind blown crap. This, uh, d- that well, just seems a, crazy. What kind of a bubble are we living in? I guess. Uh, what kind well, of we are the is- most rational, you know, sound people <laughs> right. in the world. What kind of rationaliz- rationalizing and biases are blinding me from seeing that in myself? Because for some yeah. reason, you know, I had this idea like, no, 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 I'm totally rational. Yeah. Because that might just be total bullshit. Well, which is the, the, the key piece that, that I think I'm taking out of this, right? Is if, if 50% of people are there, that there's a likelihood that I might fall within that group, right? It's a 50-50 yeah. chance. Good odds. And yet, yeah. And I yet I don't feel like I am. But I wonder if those people who do hold these beliefs, if they feel like this is an oddball belief, or, but to, to that degree, they don't. 
and there is a that their brain is working over time to say this is justified this is the way it is everybody else is is thinking crazy we're the ones who are sane so you know just going in and saying well yeah this feels right and is justified and here are the facts behind it you know somebody believing on a flat earth somebody believing in uh you know the pedophile thing for democrats uh you know ring all of those they have yeah. they have beliefs that are based on you know faulty information but they they can call on that and so in their own mind it's justified and yeah it- well, and, and Eric, you know, the, the definition that he gave it uh, early in our discussion was that believing that the, the definition of the conspiracy theory is that believing there's something complicated, right, that's causing something else to happen and accepting that as the explanation over a very plausible and empirically verifiable explanation, <laughs> You know? well, which is the thing, right? So the empirically verifiable. And I think part of the issue is that I think people are not well, we, our education system hasn't done a good job in in teaching people the scientific method and to understand scientific data. And so you're extrapolating out from small ends, you're looking at uh, correlational things and, and, and applying causal, you know, components to those, you're looking yeah. at a variety of different facets. Um, and then you're just looking at a whole bunch of fake, you know, data out there that is that people are, are yeah. propagating. So all of those things, um, I think are out there. But I think the important thing is, is for me to take away and, 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 you know, you as well, is this idea that we think we're not, consp- we're not buying into conspiracy theories or magical thinking things but are we and to test and to to come back uh what was it steve wendell said start with this idea that that everything we think of is wrong right or everything we believe is wrong systemic humility yeah Yeah, systemic humility and, and and just go from that perspective and and what are the basis for why we think what we think and yeah. you know and again we we often jump to a conclusion about something if somebody says something you know how many how many polar bears are there in the world you you automatically get a have a, have a number jump into your head or, or a range right um and that's based on you know if you're a somebody who studies that that's probably based on some factual evidence if you're not it isn't and then we get anchored in and then it gets really hard so we need to always go back and just check our you know what are we anchoring in on and are we anchoring in on things that are verifiable and, and empirical? So. Yeah. I, also, I'd like to just note that it's not that intuitionism at, in itself is bad and no. that rationalism in itself is good, right? Because we, we need both, right? We can't just be rational, right? We, we've talked about the, the experiments. Mr. Spock, why can't we just be rational? Because you seem we, to work really well. <laughs> Because, because, because the purely rational, the one hundred percent rational side would end up in a, a a never ending loop of indecision, because there's always more data to to grind on on. Yeah, and 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 you go and you look at Antonio Damasio, and he he's done a ton of research on this, and and looked at patients who have had those uh, emotional uh, areas of their brain where they something has happened to them and yeah. they get stuck in that analysis process. They can't decide which restaurant to go to because yeah. they're looking, should it's steak place, the fish place? Well, let's look at this, 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 this. And for most of us, we'll look at that and we'll look at that rational information. It will be there. Oh, steak, fish. Okay. Price points here, uh, atmosphere here. All right. I'm going to go with my gut. We're going steak tonight or we're going fish tonight. Or, or, or honey, wouldn't it be nicer to sit in the place that serves steak tonight because that's more comfy and I just really feel like a more comfortable chair. Yeah. Nothing to do with the, the food itself. Yeah. Right. It's just an emotional, uh, yeah. intuitive response like oh I, I, yeah. I asked my kids right as like what for you know let's go here i don't know i don't want to go there why oh, i just don't feel like it you know it's 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 that's what the that's how we respond on and the oh go ahead that's not bad it's not bad on the other hand the idea that 45 percent of americans believe that the fda is deliberately withholding cancer cures because of pressure from pharmaceuticals is a concern <laughs> for me 
I mean, you and I have worked in the, with pharmaceuticals for many years, and uh, these are not uh, heinous, uh, you know, evil people that that work there. You know, right. that's just it's completely implausible to me that that both both the FDA and the pharmaceutical industry would be conspiring in that way. That just seems crazy. Well, uh, what is it? Occam's razor, right? Um, yeah. You know, it, that's what, how does that go again? If I, uh, that, that the, that the, we pull a small portion of the story out and that, that misleads the rest of the, that, that doesn't tell the full story. We, we pull a, a fact out, uh, with our razor that, sl- that slims just this tiny little bit that seems to indicate that this is what the whole story is about, but it's not. Uh, yeah, uh, here, law, parsimony, uh, the problem solving for an entity should not be multiplied without necessity. Uh, basically, looking, look, the, the, the simpler answer is probably is the, the one better that one. is, is yes. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's the other little razor thing that we've we've quoted before and i'm hanlon's I'm razor hanlon's razor that was the one i was looking for yeah that's that's which, probably a better which thing. is you know don't attribute to uh malice what can be easily, better easily explained by stupidity or <laughs> right, like exactly. that, right which exactly. i think is, is a lot of this yeah. um it, i loved Sorry, to jump in. <laughs> Sorry yeah, about these yeah. rabbit holes, folks. Um, but I loved his his quote from his kid because I think it yes. really goes in yes. uh, and talks to a lot of some of the underlying things that we're we're, we're discussing here. Right when he's when he is talking about you know comforting his child because he was scared about the monsters, uh, you know, in the closet, uh, and then his son made this really wonderful, insightful comment which is if there are no monsters in the closet then why am i still afraid i mean that yeah. is profound that when you think about it and it, it goes back to um some work i i know that uh uh leon festinger looked at when he was uh, developing uh cognitive dissonance theory uh and and listen to andy luttrell who again is a upcoming guest on the show but he has a podcast called uh uh, opinion science and there's episode great. 20 which is on cognitive dissonance this is where i'm pulling this from where where leon looked at there's some older research about this massive uh, uh uh earthquake that happened up by uh in in the himalaya mountains and it devastated mm-hmm. some of the mountain or some of the villages close in, in india there but it was felt hundreds and hundreds of miles away and afterwards, there are all these conspiracy theories throughout much of India about all these horrible things that are going to be happening. And they're looking and they're trying to explain this. And what they came up with is people were feeling afraid, but they couldn't necessarily attribute it. While they might have felt a little bit of the, the earthquake shocks, you know, the, their buildings were still there. Nobody died. Nothing, you know, the shops were still open. Everything was there, but they still felt the sense of being afraid. So they had to justify that somehow. And so they justified it through conspiracy theories. And so again, if there are no monsters in the closet, then why am I still afraid? There must be monsters because I'm afraid. I have to justify that intuitive feeling that I have. Here we are in the middle of a pandemic that is very difficult for us to get our heads around because it happens infrequently, but it happens on this massive scale uh, because it's pandemic, it's global, and it leaves a lot of uncertainty in our lives. It's opened, uh, it's opened Pandora's box on uncertainty. And it's very hard to, to deal with. And as, especially when, when the science, the rational side, is, is struggling to keep up with, with good explanations. Yeah. And, and that only feeds, that only provides the seeds and the, the fertile ground for conspiracy theories to grow in. And, and, and those explanations are changing, right? They're not only just like <laughs> trying to right. find them. It's like, oh, here's one. Oh, wait, no, here's, here's this, which is kind of contradictory. And so then people can point back to that. And again, go back to that education around science, people not understanding how the scientific method works, that you're yeah. 
gaining more and more and more knowledge that any single point, any so-called truth is just a, a point in time and that there's further insights that are going to be gained um, and particularly given what's going on here. That, that's mm-hmm. just crazy. Okay, so. we could talk for an hour about Eric's we stuff could. because it's fantastic. But I have a music question for you. So <gasps> dun, 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 dun. Eric is the first guy who said, I would rather have dinner with a sports figure, my, my sports hero, than with my music hero. And that shocked the daylights out of me, right? Because as like the music guy is like, what? Because you're coming from a biased position. <laughs> of course I am. An <laughs> intuitive position. Like, why would anybody <laughs> want to talk to a sports guy? Musicians like me are so much more interesting. Definitely. So <laughs> that is my bias. It, it, it absolutely is. But here's a question for you. Um, which sports figure do you think would make for the greatest intellectual conversation? Intellectual, so it's well, kind smart. of a roundabout way of saying which is the smartest sports figure out there. Yeah, more or less. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. just say yeah. it, damn it. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I I don't know. There's there's a, there's I know there are lots and lots of very smart um, sports figures out there. I will. I do know Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback for the Green Bay Packers, is is insanely bright. I, yeah. You know, I know he's the, he was on Jeopardy, uh, and and. Yeah, not that Jeopardy is this necessarily great <laughs> well, uh, indicator of, of knowledge, but he was on there something. with, uh, yeah. oh, who is the who, astronaut and uh, somebody Mark else? Kelly? And, and, uh, yeah, and, 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 yeah, and he beat them, you know. So it, he's a smart guy. So intellectually, I bet that could be very interesting. Okay. Plus, I could ask about, you know, Dana Patrick and, you know, what, what she was like. And so there you go. It was his old girlfriend that now broke up, Tim. So that just, oh. uh, she's the race car driver, you know, yeah. 500 race car who, driver. Who did the GoDaddy commercials. Oh, <laughs> which is how you know her, right? Oh, there you go. I, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. There's All right. So there. I will, uh, so musician, who, what musician would have the most intellectually stimulating conversation over dinner for you? Again, a roundabout way of saying, which do you think is the smartest musician out there? Yeah. Well, there are, there are two that come to mind. Okay. Uh, yeah. One would be Yo-Yo Ma mm. because uh, his, he's so articulate when he, when he talks about things, he talks about issues in a way that is really uh, wise. He's a very wise guy. Uh, he's a wise much, guy. He's not a wise guy. <laughs> he's a wise man. And, um, and Bob Dylan, if, oh. if you could like calm him down and get him away from the, sort of the I'm a, I'm a rock star and you're not kind of thing away from the interview, but just actually to have a conversation. Dylan is a, I think is a very, very smart guy. Huh? Very smart. Yeah. Those are the two that come to mind. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, folks, hang on. We're going to wrap up uh, and move on to a bonus track and I'll, I'll be bringing that to you in just a minute. Hey Groovers. This is Tim with our bonus track and groove idea for the week. We found Eric's conversation nothing short of amazing and felt like we had several important takeaways from it. But here in the bonus track, we'll only list a few. First, conspiracy theories are widely held among people in the U.S. and they are closely linked to someone's willingness to believe in what Eric calls magical thinking. And even though roughly 50% of the U.S. population believes in some conspiracy theory, it was apparently contradicted by the idea that the majority of Americans are also not easily duped into believing things that aren't true. Hmm, kind of a head scratcher. Second, we really like the discussion about intuitionism as a polarizing aspect in politics. It made a lot of sense to us and we think it's a powerful lens to view our current political struggles through. Lastly, we were reminded of the benefits and pitfalls of using emotions to make our decisions. The more emotional our decisions become, the less we need facts. While that may sound troublesome, we can't eliminate emotions or heuristics from our decision making. The world is just too complex to rely on pure rationality. Our groove idea for the week is this. Give some consideration to the way you process the world. To what degree do you buy into some magical thinking in your life? Is it a lot or a little? More importantly, where would you like it to be? Would you like to dial up your intuitionism or dial it down? 
Let us know what you think. And thanks for listening in, Groovers. We hope you go out and make it a great week. <laughs>